on the morning of August 10, 2012, Liao Deying was accompanying his sister-in-law Wang Hong to a branch of the Bank of China in the Shapingba district of Chongqing. His sister-in-law had asked him to go with her as she was collecting a significant amount of money from a creditor of hers. Outside the bank, a man approached them unnoticed. Without any words or hesitation, the men shot Wang Hong and Liao Deying at point-blank range. Wang Hong was shot in the head and died instantly. Liao Deying was hit in the neck. He fell to the ground, bleeding heavily but alive. The gunman took the bag Wang Hong had been carrying and started walking away from the scene. A brave unarmed bank security guard started to go after the gunman. Seeing he was being followed, the armed man turned and shot twice at the security guard, hitting him once in the elbow. The security guard stopped giving chase, and the gunman disappeared into the city traffic. Police were called and quickly arrived at the scene. The security guard and the critically wounded Liao Deying were transported to hospital for treatment. As police started their investigation, a large crowd gathered to watch. Many people had been attracted by the gunshots ringing out in broad daylight on a busy street. Police had no shortage of witnesses. However, in this case, the police already had a very good idea who the armed robber was. A man who was wanted for a number of violent armed robberies and murders across China over the past eight years. To some, the gunman was known by the nickname Bao Tou Ge, which translates to "headshot brother." Others knew him by his real name, Zhou Kehua. He was the most wanted and notorious criminal in China. Only a few days after this robbery, the police finally caught up with him, and Zhou Kehua would be killed during a gunfight in the streets. The incident would make domestic and international headlines. The bloody image of Zhou Kehua being placed on the front page of newspapers. In death, the legend of Headshot Brother or Zhou Kehua has only grown, and even today, accusations of police cover-ups and conspiracy theories surround the man who police tried to track down for close to eight years. Zhou Kehua was born and raised in the area of Chongqing, in which he committed his final robbery, the district of Shapingba. In the year he was born, 1970, it was still a rural area. These days, it has been greatly urbanized by the sprawling growth of the megacity Chongqing. His father was an educated man, a college graduate who was working as an accountant in the city. However, it was during the time of the Cultural Revolution in China, where many people viewed as being intellectuals would be relocated to the countryside to perform rural labor. This seemed to be something his father very much resented. People who knew him would say that he made no attempts to ever make friends with anyone in the village. Rarely speaking to people and never taking part in or attending community activities, Zhou Kehua was said to take after his father in that he didn't socialize much with others and liked to keep to himself. While other kids in the village would play together after school, Zhou Kehua spent time alone doing his own thing. He didn't perform especially well academically, but proved to be something of an athlete. One of the few friends he had in the village said that young Zhou Kehua was an exceptionally strong swimmer, and the pair would spend time at the river catching crabs. Once they caught some, Zhou Kehua cracked them open and would eat them raw. This was until they started making fires to cook them. Zhou Kehua would always be the one who managed to get his hands on some matches to light the fire. The friend would describe Zhou Kehua as a very capable child, as he was more independent than other kids in the village. While he enjoyed an outdoors life by the river, his main hobby was reading. It was said that his schoolwork suffered because, when he had classes, he didn't follow the work set by the teacher. Instead, choosing to read what he enjoyed, detective novels and martial arts stories were his favorites. He ended up hanging a sandbag from a tree near his home to teach himself kung fu. He dropped out of education after finishing middle school and attempted to join the military twice. He was rejected both times, apparently due to an issue in his physical examination. Around this time, he also had his first brush with the law. In 1986, at the age of 16, he was given 14 days detention for molesting women in some way. For most of the villagers, a way to make money was to go down to the river and dig sand to sell. While others did this in groups, Zhou Kehua and his father would turn up together, work alone, and leave together without talking to other villagers. It was noted by others that, although he looked thin and weak, the teen Zhou Kehua was physically strong. He could dig a lot of sand himself. He did so much work with his father. A combination of this and the family living very frugally allowed them to save enough money to give their home a modern renovation. Once the sand digging business had been contracted out to a private company, the young Zhou Kehua had to look for work outside the village. In 1991, he committed his first known robbery, although it wouldn't be as big as the crimes he committed later in his life. 
he broke into another villager's home. He would get away with only 9 RMB cash and some stamps for rice. But he would also find and take the old man's hunting rifle. This would kick off a love affair he developed with Gans. In 1993 Zhou Kehua left the village for the first time in his life. But what he was planning to do is unknown. He told his parents he had found work in Wuhan in Hubei province. However, he had taken the gun he stole with him, and it was discovered by police. Zhou Kehua was sentenced to two years of labor re-education. In the report about his arrest for carrying the firearm it was stated that, while being questioned by the officers that arrested him, Zhou Kehua fired into the ground to escape. After being released he returned to Sha Pingba and found work as a porter at the local train station. He was introduced to a woman from the village and the two married and had a son. To try and make more money he rented a minibus and was effectively a private bus driver in the town. While for a time he earned a decent income from this, it would literally come to a crashing halt. He was involved in an accident while driving the bus which was overloaded with passengers. Zhou Kehua escaped the crash unharmed but many of the people on board required hospital treatment. Being an illegal bus, Zhou Kehua had no insurance and couldn't afford to pay compensation for his injured passengers' medical treatment. His driver's license was revoked after the accident and he became unemployed while facing mounting debts. The stress this caused would eventually cause his marriage to break up. It was after this that Zhou Kehua went off-grid. His parents, ex-wife, child and others who knew him lost all contact. He didn't resurface until four years later. While there is no definitive explanation for what Zhou Kehua did during this period of his life, the most common theory is that he went to Myanmar and found work as a mercenary. The China-Myanmar border is located close to the notorious Golden Triangle, an area of Southeast Asia consisting of Laos, Myanmar, and Thailand. The region has long been infamous for the trafficking of drugs like heroin, people, and guns. Zhou Kehua had prior experience of visiting the area. In 1997, not long after being released from the re-education center, he traveled to the border to buy a gun. This time he bought a handgun as it would be easier to conceal than the shotgun he had been caught with. Originally, it was officially denied that Zhou Kehua had worked as a mercenary in Myanmar. But his later criminal career would suggest he picked up particular skills from somewhere. If the police knew where he was and what he was doing during this time they would have released that information. But for a period of around four years Zhou Kehua was a ghost. What can be said for certain is that by the 22nd of April 2004, Zhou Kehua was back in China and back in the city of Chongqing. On this day two female employees of a hotel, both working in the financial department went to a nearby bank to withdraw money from an ATM. After successfully getting the money, a man stepped forward with a gun pointed at the two women. He shot one in the head killing her instantly, the other would receive critical injuries but survive. The gunman took a bag with the cash and left the scene. It would become a familiar modus operandi to the police in the future. The gunman was later found out to be Zhou Kehua starting his years of robberies. He got away with 70,000 RMB, about 10,000 US dollars today. It was felt at the time that the thief must have been watching the hotel for a while to know when the employees would go to the ATM to withdraw such a large sum of money. Witnesses at the scene were able to give a physical description of Zhou Kehua but little else. They all told the same story. The men approached the women as they left the bank and shot without saying a word, before taking the money and calmly walking away. After the robbery it seems Zhou Kehua disappeared again. There is no information on what he did for the next months. Eventually with no real evidence to go on, the investigation into the robbery and murder outside the bank faded away. It wouldn't be until the 16th of May the following year that Zhou Kehua would emerge. He once again would rob people leaving an ATM, this time in his home area of Sha Pingba. He reportedly hung around the ATM keeping a keen eye on the buttons being pressed as people withdrew money. Once he had his targets acquired he used the same method. As a couple walked away from the ATM after withdrawing money, he stepped forward wordless, pistol raised. He shot twice killing both people. A witness this time did step forward to try and stop him but would be shot and injured for his bravery. The witness survived the attack. Again, Zhou Kehua took the bag containing the cash and calmly walked away from the scene. This time he got away with 170,000 RMB close to 24,000 US dollars today. At this time in China the economy was starting to really grow and people who were raised in extreme poverty were now making money. 
This caused many people to have a mistrust of keeping their money in banks. They feared the money would vanish if the bank closed, so they would withdraw large sums often and keep it closer to them. The police just as before were left with a description and little physical evidence. But since the two robbery homicides were so similar they were linked, the police knowing they were looking for the same person for both crimes. They had produced sketches of the suspect based on eyewitness descriptions, but neither looked much like the person the police were looking for. This time, however, his activities after the robbery are known. On the 16th of October, he was traveling by train between Chongqing and Kunming in Yunnan province, a place he had previously obtained a gun. When he arrived at a train station in Xunwei city, the police were searching people's belongings. When the police searched him, they found him carrying a holstered pistol and a number of bullets. They arrested Zhou Kehua, who was sentenced to another three years in prison. Because the arrest happened in Yunnan province, the police were not especially aware of the robberies in Chongqing, so no one thought to make a connection. He was released in 2008 and soon returned to his robbery homicide career. However, his next crime would carry with it considerably more risk and was seemingly done to get hold of a firearm. In the evening of March 19, 2009, soldier Han Junliang was stood on his post standing sentry to a military communication building. Other guards on duty at the time were relaxing in the guardroom. Dressed in black, Zhou Kehua approached and shot the soldier killing him. He then fired on the other soldiers who ran into the facility to raise the alarm. Zhou Kehua took the slain soldier's semi-automatic rifle and began walking away from the scene. The military station at the base came out in force to look for the gunman. They were quickly joined by the police. Numerous eyewitnesses saw the suspect walk up a nearby hillside but an extensive search all night and the following day came up with nothing. Again there was no clear description of the gunman and no physical evidence. The army declared it a terrorist attack and for the next few days they would search the city for the gunman. Their efforts would prove to be fruitless and once again Zhou Kehua would just vanish. Even a 300,000 RMB reward on the head of Zhou Kehua brought the police and military no information to help them find the outlaw. The murder of a soldier on a military base had received a lot of attention in the media, and as a result Zhou Kehua left Chongqing. There was a much more noticeable police presence on the streets making it riskier for him to commit any more crimes for the time being. He headed to Changsha, the main city of Hunan province. He arrived in the city sometime before October 14th. There is little information on his activities before this, but he would soon make his presence known. In the Tianxin Park, Li Chengshou, a 56-year-old farmer was walking up the park's hill for some exercise. He bumped into Zhou Kehua and was shot six times killing him. The man didn't have any money on it except for 20 RMB which was still in his pocket when police found the body. There has never been any clear explanation as to why Zhou Kehua shot the man, even after the crime was linked to him. The most likely theory is that Zhou Kehua was shooting a gun in a quiet area of the park to test it was in good working order. The noise attracted Li Chengshou, who saw Zhou Kehua with the weapons. He was then killed to keep him quiet. It didn't take long for Zhou Kehua to return to robbery homicides. On December 4, 2009, still in Changsha and still in the area close to the park where he shot and killed Li Chengshou, Zhou Kehua struck, fatally shooting a man who had just left the bank and was returning to his car. With this robbery, the police would finally get a clue to the identity of Zhou Kehua. While he was caught on CCTV, there wasn't a clear image of his face. But the police managed to get a DNA profile off the cartridge of the spent bullet. As was his pattern, Zhou Kehua would lie dormant again for around a year with little information as to what he did, or where he was during this time. He didn't resurface until the October of 2010, when he gunned down the manager of a local business in the busy street outside the company premises. He shot the victim once in the head, killing him instantly. He took the dead man's laptop computer before calmly walking away from the scene, leaving behind a number of shocked onlookers. His next crime in Changsha would also be his last in the city. On the morning of June 28, 2011, he shot a 48-year-old man. The man was shot twice, once in the head and once in the stomach, as he was getting out of his car. Miraculously, neither of the wounds would prove to be fatal and the man survived the attack. The police once again were quick to link this attack with the other crimes. Since guns and shootings are so rare in China, having four in the same city in such a short space of time made it obvious to the police that they were looking for the same man for each incident. They looked to the public for help and released wanted posters giving what images they had of the gunman and the physical description of the person. 
but Zhou Kehua left the city some time after that shooting. His father had fallen ill, so for the first time in many years he returned to his village. His father would soon pass away from his illness, but Zhou Kehua stayed in the village for a while. He lived with his wife who he left years ago and his son. Although the couple had been separated, they had never actually got an official divorce. At this time they would get it done. He stayed in the village for a few months before moving on to a new hunting ground. This time he headed to Nanjing, in the province of Jiangsu on China's east coast. On the 6th of January 2012, he struck again. The robbery followed his well-practiced pattern. He watched people withdrawing money and waited for the right target. He had his man, stepped forward and shot to the head at point-blank range. The victim was killed instantly. Zhou Kehua got away with 20,000 RMB, almost 3,000 US dollars, but unbeknownst to him a net was about to tighten around him. The police in Changsha hadn't given up on finding the individual responsible for the four shootings in the city. They had been talking to other police forces in different provinces and linked the incidents in their city to those in Chongqing. They had also extensively combed through CCTV footage finding any images they could of the suspect to try and track his movements. They had managed to discover the buses he would use and places he would spend time. Most importantly, they tracked him to an internet cafe he used often. Throughout his crimes, Zhou Kehua had shown a remarkable ability to hide his face. He used fairly simple methods such as wearing sunglasses or baseball caps, but even the police in Changsha looked at day-to-day -day footage of him. They never could find a clear look at the face of Zhou Kehua. In the internet cafe, he let his guard down. Perhaps not realizing that the police could access the computer's webcam, he was comfortable to show his face. The Changsha police managed to finally grab clear images of Zhou Kehua. They now had images, a DNA profile, and knew he came from somewhere near Sichuan province. They just didn't have a name or a current location. The robbery in Nanjing gave his whereabouts away. Nanjing police also obtained a DNA sample of a spent bullet casing. At the same time, police in Chongqing had started going through registration records. They discovered that Zhou Kehua, who had previous criminal convictions related to firearms, had not registered a residence for a number of years. The Chongqing police got a DNA profile from family members of Zhou Kehua, and it matched with the DNA profiles from Changsha and Nanjing. The government finally had a name. Images of Zhou Kehua were broadcast around the country and posters put up around Nanjing. The police performed a massive citywide search checking all transport, leaving the region. Despite his face being broadcast nationwide, police and the military looking for him and closer to being caught than any time previously, Zhou Kehua once again seemed to vanish. The police had publicized an astonishing reward of 5 million RMB, close to 700,000 US dollars for information leading to his arrest. But despite this there was no sign of him. Days later while walking a hillside in the city, an old man discovered a sleeping bag and other evidence someone had been camping there. With the manhunt still going on he informed the police about his finding. DNA samples showed that the items were used by Zhou Kehua, and this is where he had been hiding out for some time. It was once again too late. Zhou Kehua was gone. But at least this time they had exposed his identity to the public and so felt it was only a matter of time before they caught up with him. He eventually resurfaced in the city of Yibin in Sichuan province not far from Chongqing. Here he met a woman who would gain her own notoriety for becoming his girlfriend even if it was just for a few months. Throughout his eight-year-long crime spree there was never anyone closely connected to Zhou Kehua. He didn't appear to have any accomplices, no one has come forward to say they knew him and he had little to no contact with his family. It is perhaps why there has been a fascination with the woman who identified as his girlfriend who has had almost as many articles written about her as Zhou Kehua. Zhang Guiying grew up in Xintian village in Yibin city. As an infant she almost died through illness but recovered. It would only be the start of her health issues. In the third grade of primary school she started suffering from what people in the village call Zhu Po Feng, which essentially translates as pig madness. She would suffer convulsions and foam at the mouth during attacks. Doctors eventually diagnosed her with epilepsy. However, the condition isn't something that people in the village understood or were comfortable being around, as the name Pig Madness would suggest. She would feel isolated at school and in the village, finding it difficult to make friends with other children who were scared of her illness, believing they may catch it from her. Her studies suffered because of this isolation and she dropped out of education after finishing middle school. 
Like many other young people who grew up in poor rural villages, she joined the migrant worker army that headed to the Greater Bay Area. The Greater Bay Area is a term used to describe the regions of Hong Kong, Macau, and Guangdong. It is made up of nine cities which are manufacturing and trade hubs. The cities Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Dongguan all have large migrant worker populations who fill up the factories. She stayed in the region working until 2011 before returning to Yibin City. She was offered a job in a massage parlor which was being run by a relative of hers. She worked there for a time before moving on to another parlor in the city. Something about Zhang Guiying attracted Zhou Kehua, and he became a regular client of hers. Soon a relationship began between them. Zhou Kehua gave her 10,000 RMB a week, and showered her with gifts of gold and diamond jewelry which she gave to her mother to look at her. He didn't care about her epilepsy and paid for her medical treatment. He bought her younger brother a laptop when she mentioned he wanted one. It isn't known if she was aware that her boyfriend Liu Dong was in fact Zhou Kehua when they first met, but he would eventually tell her. She told her family that the man she was seeing was a doctor, but they never met him. And she didn't seem to have any issues dating the most wanted man in the country. Only a few months later he would commit his final crimes. After killing Wang Hong and injuring Liao Deying and the bank's security guard, perhaps knowing how big the police response would be, he got onto the back of a motorbike taxi to get away. The driver didn't get a chance to look at his passenger, but later realized who the man was and went to the police. He dropped him off close to a bus stop where Zhou Kehua got on a bus. He then contacted Zhang Guiying and asked her to meet him at a location they both knew. She did as he asked and Zhou Kehua gave her two packages of cash and told her to put one into a bank account. He then left looking to get out of the city and vanish as he had done many times before. This time it almost didn't work. Police had previously struggled to find out how he could seemingly vanish without trace, but here they would find one technique he used and it was very simple. Rather than use transport to leave the area he walked. He got to the train tracks and walked along them whatever distance he needed to go to get to his hideouts. Police would be busy looking for him using vehicles to escape and there were few security cameras on the tracks. On the day Zhou Kehua was making his way out of the city to head to his home area of Sha Pingba, some plainclothes transport police were also on the tracks, investigating an unrelated crime. Spotting him one of the officers, a man named Zhu Yan Chao, approached Zhou Kehua just to inquire as to what he was doing on the tracks. Without even realizing who it was, Zhu Yan Chao was shot by Zhou Kehua. His body was found lying on the side of the tracks two hours later. The shooting happened in an area close to a wooded hill called Gele Mountain. Zhou Kehua had disappeared in a hillside after the shooting at the military base and had items found on a hillside in Nanjing. With this knowledge the police called in the military to help perform a massive search of the area. A cave was found that Zhou Kehua had been using as a place to hide, but it looked like the gunman had abandoned the idea of staying there after the shooting of Zhu Yanchao on the railway tracks. Text messages between Zhou Kehua and Zhang Guiying showed that at the time the mountain was being searched he had already left it, and was so confident he wouldn't be caught he was already planning his next robberies. He had been to a local department store and bought two cell phones, he asked Zhang Guiying to meet him so he could get one tour. However, people in the area had recognized him and quickly got in contact with the police. The two would meet shortly after and Zhou Kehua gave her the phone. She had brought her makeup kit with her to try and disguise a slight birthmark he had on his face. The police now knowing that he wasn't hiding out on the mountain decided to try and lull Zhou Kehua into a false sense of security. They kept a large team on the hillside to make Zhou Kehua think they thought he was still there. At the same time a large number of undercover officers were stationed around the area he was seen. From information given to them by the store that sold Zhou Kehua the phones, the police could now try and track his communications. They intercepted a message between Zhou Kehua and Zhang Guiying and were able to get an idea of his location. The police dispatched plainclothes officers who were armed to the area. Two officers in plain clothes, Zhou Jin and Wang Xiaoyu, spotted Zhou Kehua walking in an area close to a bank. In the messages the police intercepted, Zhou Kehua told Zhang Guiying he was planning something for the 14th. That was today. Sensing he was being followed Zhou Kehua turned and shot three times, each bullet missed, hitting telegraph poles which gave the police some slight protection. The officers fired back with four shots. Zhou Kehua was hit and killed, the fatal shot a headshot. Police searched the body as it lay dead in the street. 
Zhou Kehua was carrying a small amount of cash and a few fake ID cards which no doubt helped him hide from the police over the years. He was also carrying two pistols, one he used to shoot at the officers with, the other was being carried in a bag. The officers at the scene believed that Zhou Kehua was on his way to his next robbery target when they intercepted him. Soon after the gunfight Zhang Guiying would be arrested, she was staying in a room in a building where Zhou Kehua was renting the entire floor. Zhang Guiying was charged with harboring a criminal and concealing the proceeds of crime. On March 22, 2013 she was sentenced to five years in prison. She did not appeal the sentence and was released in 2017. In previous videos I have talked about the incidents involving the mass shooter Hu Wenhai, who killed 14 people in Shanxi province, and the Deng Yujiao case where a young woman killed a government official in self-defense. Both people and the incidents served as inspiration for characters in the movie A Touch of Sin. Zhou Kehua would also have a character in the movie based on him, his life and crimes. In the film the character commits his crimes not out of necessity but because he enjoys the sport of it. This is something that was suggested of Zhou Kehua before the movie was made. Of what the police could piece together about his life, it appears Zhou Kehua lived very frugally. He didn't seem to spend money on himself. What money he did get would go to his parents, ex-wife and child and later Zhang Guiying. The only thing Zhou Kehua treated himself to was guns. This added to his legend which made people fascinated by his story after he had been gunned down in the streets. The claims he worked as a mercenary in Myanmar has at various times been dismissed and suggested by different police forces. His ability to evade detection, even when massive searches were taking place, his comfort of living in wooded areas and his ability to handle and maintain his firearms suggests some form of military experience. And while he did try to join the Chinese army twice in his youth, he was turned down for some fake physical issue. So if he did have some military experience, he didn't receive it in the more traditional method. There was also the planning he would put into his robberies. While for a time they seemed to just be random attacks, it was noticeable that the locations chosen were all areas that had multiple transport options for him to escape. Also the robbery locations were almost always close to a wooded area for him to hide away in the aftermath. From evidence found by police he could spend days evading search teams this way, which again would suggest some type of training. Then the attack at the military barracks in Chongqing. To have the confidence to walk up to a military facility and face people armed with semi-automatic firearms with only a pistol and machete does suggest that he knew what he was doing. Curiously, the gun he took a huge risk to steal from the military base was never used in any of his crimes, and there was no record of the police ever finding it. There have been suggestions that it was stolen to order by someone, and Zhou Kehua was paid for his services. He was giving Zhang Guiying a significant amount of money each week which couldn't have just been from his robberies, especially as much of that went to his family. So he had to have another income stream. This has caused many to believe that two of the incidents in Changsha were not just robberies but paid assassinations, as the incidents didn't fit his normal pattern. The shootings of October 2010, where he only took a laptop from the victim, and June 2011, where the target survived, stood out as being different. While the method of walking up to someone in the street and shooting them was his usual MO, apart from the laptop in the first case he didn't take anything. The two targets were relatively wealthy successful businessmen, which has many people believing that the two incidents were hit jobs. This would no doubt have been more financially lucrative for Zhou Kehua if that was the case. Conspiracy theories began to spring up almost as soon as images of Zhou Kehua lying dead in the street were published. One of the more notable ones at the time was that the man gunned down by the two officers was not Zhou Kehua, but a plainclothes police officer from Changsha. As the Changsha police had done much of the heavy lifting in discovering the identity of Zhou Kehua and linking the robberies, which became known as the Su Xiangyu robbery homicides, they sent a special task force to Chongqing to assist in the search for Zhou Kehua. It was claimed that the man shot by the two Chongqing officers was actually a member of the Changsha task force named Fang Bin. This was one of the names on an ID card that was being carried by Zhou Kehua at the time of his death. The Changsha police denied having any officer with that name on the force, however they did admit there was a man who worked in the drug rehabilitation department with a similar name but they were not sent to Chongqing. There was then a photo circulated of an officer who was in the Changsha task force and who did have a resemblance to Zhou Kehua. It was claimed his name was Chen Zihe and he was the man shot in Chongqing. There were then photos circulated of an supposed police wallet and ID found in the belongings of Zhou Kehua. However, the theory was quickly disproven as the officer in question was interviewed on television. 
He didn't know about the theory that was circulated online and when confronted with the idea that he was dead he seemed a little taken aback. The officer had the family name Blunt and was very much alive, well and still a serving police officer. Despite the theory being easily disproven, the talk of some kind of conspiracy or police cover-up didn't stop there. Questions and doubts were put forward about the two officers involved in the shootout with Zhou Kehua, which eventually caused his death. There was a feeling that their story was a little too fantastic and did not happen the way they claimed it did. First, many people felt that the idea of them being lucky enough for the shots fired at them to hit a telegraph pole was unlikely. Then a camera that was looking over the scene of the supposed shootout being broken at the time and so not recording the incident was too coincidental. It was noticed that the officers wore police uniforms with different numbers in various interviews after the shootout. This caused many people online to be skeptical of the two men's identities, many people believing they weren't involved in the shootout at all. Instead the theory was that, knowing he was cornered Zhou Kehua chose to end his own life and the police took the credit for his death. Again the theory was disproven, evidence at the scene supported the police officer's version of events and that the headshot that killed Zhou Kehua was not self-inflicted. As for the officers wearing uniforms with different numbers, the answer was simple. At the time of the first interview they were originally still in plain clothes. When the TV news wanted to interview them they were asked to be in uniform. They borrowed shirts from other officers at the scene. In a bid to put an end to the speculation and rumor about the case, the police took the unusual step of releasing autopsy photos of Zhou Kehua. They showed the gunshot wound to the head in graphic detail. However, the decision had the opposite effect than was intended. It only served to increase the suspicion that the police were covering something up. As many people refused to believe that the body in the photos belonged to Zhou Kehua. There were claims the distance between the nose and the eyes of the person in the autopsy photo and photos of Zhou Kehua was different. But the main point of contention were the ears. People felt that the shape and size of the ears was too different for the photos to be of the same person. This time the response of the police was quite weak. The rebuttal was that people were basing their opinion from a profile of a mugshot which only showed one side of the head of Zhou Kehua. It was said that the online investigators were comparing the ears that were on opposite sides of the head. Other forensic doctors came out and said that the differences were largely down to the different angles at which the photos were taken. While many have refused to accept the explanations and do not believe that Zhou Kehua was killed that day, the biggest evidence against this would be that the robbery stopped. Since 2012 there hasn't been another robbery homicide with the modus operandi of Zhou Kehua. Today most people accept that Zhou Kehua was the person who was shot and killed on that day. Much of the theories at the time came from a deep mistrust many people had of the police. However, there will still be articles and forum posts asking if Headshot Brother is really dead. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video please consider giving it a like, subscribing and leaving a comment. And we hope to see you again for the next dark tale from the Middle Kingdom.